Good morning and happy spring. Uh, it's a, and it's a good spring day, right? Um, Andy. I'm good with the slides. Tell, you tell me when. How about now? Okay. <laughs> so we have a slide and there's something different about it. And I am hoping there will be a couple people that notice what's different. <laughs> we now have an official new name, which many have been waiting for a very long time. And the new name is Ewing Covenant Presbyterian Church without a hyphen. Definitely worth celebrating. And thank you to uh, the visioning team, the session, and all the uh, congregational members that participated in making that decision. But uh, it would be a lot easier now to move forward, right? <laughs> so that's the great news. I just wanted to mention that the Easter flowers uh, are, the information is in the bulletin and will be in the newsletter, but it is time to order the Easter flowers. And the ESWA service group will be meeting, oh, not until the, what is the date? The second Tuesday of this coming month and lunch bunch is going to be meeting the third Thursday each month. Okay, the third Thursday. I want to be sure everybody gets that on their calendar. And if you ever have any questions about it, I think you can refer to, he's not looking at me yet. I think you can refer <laughs> to Buzz. <laughs> okay, very good. So, um, hey. Can't think of anything else. Does anybody else have any other announcements? Well, on this beautiful spring day, let us worship God. We light this candle to remind us of Christ's presence with us in the midst of this pandemic, connecting us all in our separate places strengthening all those serving the front lines of this pandemic, encouraging all who have been laid low. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As we begin spring, I'll offer a confession. The raspiness that you hear in my voice, I have tested negative for everything. It is the pollen attack that yeah. has happened to me in the past few days. Yeah, man. So, be assured. Yes. Um, please join me in our responsive call to worship. You are God, we earnestly seek you. In the dry and parched land, there is no water. Our community longs for your baptismal waters. Let your waters flow and be our sanctuary. O Lord, we behold your power and glory. Let our lips glorify you and praise you. Your hand upholds us and lifts us up. Lift us as we sing in the shadow of your wings. Please join me in standing, continue standing as we sing the hymn of praise number 65, Guide Me Thou, Guide Me O Thou Great Jehovah.
friends, be glad that our God is a forgiving God. When we recognize and name our inequities, we confess that we are mortal, and we confess that our God is a forgiving God. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Reading together. <clears throat> Merciful God, we recognize that we have fallen short in thought, word, and deed. We have not always lived up to being our best selves in what we have done and what we have left undone. But even in our sin, we strive to remember that you love us. In recognizing your love, we realize that we seek to love our neighbor in thought, word, and deed. We repent for our shortcomings and rejoice in your grace. Amen. Brothers, sisters, and siblings in Christ, share in the good news. Today, like all days, we rejoice, for we are all forgiven. Let us sing our congregational response, O Lamb of God. I leave with you, my peace I give to you. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us make a sign of Christ's peace with one another, either through a heart or a peace sign, both for the folks in this room and for the folks at home. You're all blurry. That's us, yeah. That's, typ that's typical. <laughs> we'll get the we'll get the choir later. Surprise. For the folks at home, we're having a surprise time for children. Uh, but we have to find the child. Yeah. <laughs> we're kind of like uh, the wise men at Christmas, you know, looking for the child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the first line of that song is, O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. And sometimes, you know, we... You're just full of energy. I wish I had that kind of energy. Often, often we have this sense of... Uh, where we don't feel like dancing, right? 
And, and those kind of feelings, well, sometimes we only feel like dancing. And one of the reasons to dance is because God has taken away the sins of the world. And no matter what has happened, God is with us. And that gives us a sense of peace, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this week, as we do our dancing, we think about one of the big reasons we can dance is because God has taken away the sins of the world. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. 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 Good job, right? Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Good job. All right. Now you can go back. <laughs> the joy of having such a happy child in our midst, yes. Yeah. Okay. Please pray with me. The Lord our God. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Draw us in to pay careful attention to your word. Give us all the grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The first scripture reading today is from the uh, prophet of Isaiah, the 55th chapter from verses 1 to verse 9. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that you do not know shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. <clears throat> For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Here ends the scripture. Wrong direction.
Friends, please pray with me. Oh God, speak through me, if necessary, despite me, and all ways beyond me. That as our choir just sang, that I might tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. In your name we pray. Amen. Today's second scripture passage comes from the 13th chapter of the gospel according to Luke. Hear now for what the Spirit is saying to the church. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. What, why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do bad things happen because people have not Repentant. Are people supposed to repent after bad things happen in case such bad things might happen to them? Today's scripture speaks of unspeakable acts of human destruction or natural destruction and then invites the hearer, which is to say us, to realize that such experiences are not reserved for sinners, nor do they happen because of our sins. The moral calculus of bad things happening only to bad people and good things happening to good people seems to be dismissed by Jesus as naive. Now, some false prophets who tend to get a lot of airtime will claim that such disasters as Hurricane Katrina occur because America has gay people. Putting morality aside and just thinking of it in terms of being in control wouldn't it be really safe for the ego if we could know exactly what actions would put us in danger and to only act in ways that would result in our benefit? If only God were a divine ATM in which we could input something and expect to get out exactly what we want. But of course, we are not the ones in control. And God is not to be manipulated. Rosa will know the library at Princeton Seminary has an umbrella holder as you enter the building. And it is easy to miss the old tiny black brass placard on the umbrella holder that quotes the Hebrew Bible. The rain falls on the just and on the unjust. <laughs> as most jokes do, it provides some humor, but also points to a deeper truth one of the truths that Jesus is communicating in this passage. And just as when I was here two weeks ago, today's passage is really divided into three parts. In the first two, Jesus speaks of the death of Samaritans, as well as the deaths of those who were, who, on whom the Tower of Siloam fell. With both, Jesus indicates that what happened to them is not because they were worse sinners than anybody else. And in response to sharing each of these stories, he invites the hearer to take action in response. And this action is for all of us to repent. 
Repent, which literally means to turn around and walk the other way, is often used synonymously with confessing our sins. And Jesus surely seems to include that meaning. But frequently when Jesus says repent, right after it, he invites the hearer to come and follow him. Repent and follow me is a common phrase for us in the Gospels. So in light of how tragedy can befall any one of us, and actually on every day of our lives even, he invites us to feel the urgency to repent and follow him. A friend of mine had a dish towel that his mother bought when they were on vacation at a Christian knickknack store. Most dish towels that have sayings on them are cutesy kinds of sayings, often double entendres about food or drink, such as wine a little more. <laughs> but my friend's mother's dish towel read, hell is hot, time is short, and eternity lasts a long time. <laughs> Here's supper. <laughs> I could split hairs and say that about in this passage today, Jesus was seeking to instill urgency rather than fear, per se. But if we stopped two thirds of the way through the passage, we might hear from Jesus something like that dish towel. But in the third section of this passage, he tells us a parable of a fig tree. And in the parable, the owner of the vineyard wants the tree that doesn't bear fruit to be cut down. You see, a common teaching in the marriage and family therapy world is that when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment, the environment in which it grows, not the flower. You'll notice the gardener said, how about we fix the soil first before we cut it down? And the meaning of this quote is that frequently the best intervention for a misbehaving child is for the parents to work on themselves, and that in changing themselves, their child will often change. In the scripture passage, when the owner of the vineyard wants the non-bearing tree to be cut down, the gardener responds like that quote saying, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. This whole faith thing, this repentance and following Jesus and salvation thing is not quite as simple as hell is hot, time is short, and eternity lasts a long time. Salvation involves not just a flower or a tree blooming, but also the master gardener giving it the best chance to bloom. In fact, the reformed faith is clear that salvation is not something that we accomplish, but something that God does. And even more, we don't believe in God and follow Jesus out of fear or out of personal interest of whether our eternal elevator will go up or down at the end of our life. Rather, we respond in love to God and God's people because God loves us. As 1 John says, we love God because God first loved us. So I know you all will be very surprised when I tell you this, but my wife, who happens to be the senior pastor across the river at Mooresville Presbyterian Church, she only takes me out in public occasionally. <laughs> and she never stays with me on the occasion that I all too willingly oblige a street evangelist and engage them in conversation. <laughs> a little over a decade ago, while I was walking in downtown Princeton, a man who was dressed up in a three-piece suit and clearly looking for passers-by to engage, stopped me and spoke to me first in an overly friendly manner before quickly turning to his reason for the encounter. Sir, are you saved? I first thanked him for asking me rather than just assuming that I wasn't, as most evangelists do. And then I said, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by asking if I'm saved, but on the whole, sure, yes, I, I'd say I am. My wife knew well enough to keep walking at this point and offered <laughs> me one of those waves without looking back. And the man looked at me a little suspect and asked me when I was saved. In all sincerity, I told him about 2,000 years ago on a hill outside Jerusalem. And just like that, his face dropped, he walked away. <laughs> this man suddenly wanted nothing to do with me, just like my wife had done 10 seconds ago. But beneath 
a bit of tongue and cheekness, I meant every word of what I said. Salvation is not something that happens because of a decision that I make. Rather, salvation is something that God does. In the Gospel of Matthew, the literary device of sheep and goats is used quite frequently. The sheep are the faithful, and the goats are the ones who are led astray. And in Martin Luther's commentary on the Gospel, he remarks that we needn't spend all of our time deciphering if we are a sheep or a goat. Rather, what really matters the most is whether or not God is a carnivore. <laughs> because if God is a carnivore, then, well, I'll give a second for that to make its way around the room. <laughs> you see, it is the character of God, not our character, that matters most in the process of salvation. And yet, while that statement is true, it also isn't quite the full truth. Salvation is something God does, and it is also a reality in which we participate. If the tree is not blooming, the gardener adds extra manure for the, for the tree to participate by blooming next year. And being saved on a hill outside of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, we also take heed of Jesus' word in this passage to repent. We might already have tickets to the grand banquet, but as we are to be participants, Jesus wants us to become the kind of people who would enjoy such a banquet. Grace might save us, but if we rely exclusively on it rather than living into it, it might save us while we're kicking and screaming. In the very last sentence of this passage, the gardener compromises with the vineyard owner and says, if it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. And perhaps it is a compromise. Or perhaps the gardener is saying to the owner, all right, you can cut it down. Either interpretation could have some validity, or perhaps it is actually one utterance in a line of bargaining that includes events such as Abraham bargaining with God. You'll remember when God was planning to destroy Sodom. And Abraham pleaded with God that if he found 50 righteous people in the city that God should not destroy it. Down and down the number went. Abraham, like a child who has gotten what they wanted, but wants an even better deal, Abraham keeps lowering the number and eventually gets God down to needing only 10 righteous people in order to save Sodom. Part of what I take away from all this is that both justice and mercy live in and through God. And that we are welcome to appeal to God's mercy but that we ought not take it for granted. I wouldn't bet my soul on getting an extension of another year if I were the tree, but as a bystander, I'd bet that gardener would bargain pretty hard for another year if the manure doesn't result in its blossoming the next year. I trust you see where I'm going with that. There is an ancient image from the Eastern Church Fathers that describes the process of salvation of a thick, coarse rope pulled through a hole that is only as large, and the rope is as large as the hole itself. Mud is caked onto that rope, and you have to pull the rope through that hole only as big as the rope, and all the mud has to be painstakingly ripped off of it. And of course, it stands to reason that some ropes have more mud caked on them, and others perhaps only have a little. But to get to the other side, to be pulled through that hole, the puller exerts great effort to rip all of the mud that is caked into those coarse rope fibers. It is a painstaking process, especially for the rope. <laughs> but ultimately, once all the mud is ripped off, the rope can be cleared fully through that hole. The rope puller can likely pull any rope through, but the rope gets a say in how much mud gets caked on it and how painful it will be to have the mud ripped off. You see, salvation is what God does and what we participate in. And 
God cares deeply about our motivations and our desires in that process. Because most of all, God wants not our fear, but our love. Terrified children are often quite obedient, but beloved children learn to love. God doesn't want us to come to God just out of fear of hell as that dish towel invites. Rather, God invites each of us to embrace God's mercy, but also not to forget about God's judgment, about God's justice. And God invites us to be participants of such justice and mercy in the world. That banquet will be one that only those who have come to love justice and mercy will be likely to enjoy, at least at first. And as best as I understand this passage and this God, which is to say only a little bit, it is not that there is no fire. But God is not threatening to use the fire to eviscerate us. Rather, as Jesus says, repent throughout this passage, he's wanting to keep the fire under our feet. The gardener can chop down the tree or he can add manure. God could have demanded 50 righteous people in Sodom, but God settled for 10. Live into the reality of God's justice, but never forget at the heart of this gospel is a God who is full of mercy. For those of us who are really bad sinners, and for those of us who perhaps are a bit more righteous, I think God would just rather us not put God to the test. Unless we only think of this lesson as applied to ourselves, I want to remind all of us that all of those others that this is intended for as well. There's another teaching similar to that rope teaching, but it's less metaphorical. Instead, it focuses on what each of us does with our lives. To what extent do we repent and follow Jesus? And to what extent do mercy and justice live through us? Or to what extent do they not? The former is a way that is soul enlarging and the latter is a path that is soul destroying. At the end of our lives, it is up to God to determine if there is enough of a soul left to reconstitute the human person. We can enlarge or destroy much of our soul and our living, but ultimately just how much of a soul is needed for God to work with, it's up to God. The God who created the world with only words, who created everything on the first five days and called them good. The God who on the sixth day created each of us and called us very good. We belong to God and our salvation belongs to God. And we are invited to participate in all of it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, please continue in worship with me. Remain seated as we recite our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God our Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me, if you are able, in rise and singing our hymn of affirmation number 442, Just As I Am.
You may be seated. In our prayers of the people, I will pause after every couple of lines, and you're invited to share aloud your own petition that might relate to what I've just shared. And after each person shares their petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you will all respond, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Perfect. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray for the church, the world, and for all in need. For your church in every place that we may worship and serve you faithfully. For leaders and people in every land, that they may know your way and do your will. For justice throughout the world, that there may be peace and plenty for all. For the earth you have made, that it may flourish in beauty and show your glory. For all those who hunger and thirst, that they may be filled with good things. For those who are ill or close to death, that they may know your loving care. For, for Charlotte Duthie, a friend of Sharon Danner's, who is in hospice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. My cousin Betty Ann is also in hospice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Wade Allen, who's now in the hospital. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Lord, we also lift up Dick Anthony, who is recovering from surgery, Kim Conti and her family as they mourn the loss of her sister Mindy. And of course, we also pray for the people of Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Receive all these prayers, O God, in the tenderness of your mighty hand, and strengthen our hands to serve you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as he has taught us to pray, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We invite you now to contemplate one way you share your gifts with the church, whether that is through a financial contribution and or through a contribution of your time. The offertory plates are uh, here, here, and back over there. Let us prepare to contemplate.
blessings of this and all our days, we thank you, gracious God. Accept our gifts, not just in these plates, but through our talents, offered in gratitude for all you have done for us. Use them both here in this place and wherever you may take us. Amen. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn, number 441, Hear the Good News of Salvation. in light of all the tragedies that sometimes surround us in this world, let us be grateful to God that we have at least another day to live and serve God. May we live evermore into that justice and mercy that is the very heart of God, salvation God offers us, and that we participate in. And now may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all all of you, those around you, and those you are called to love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.